Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, I did already push the button. You don't have to ask to make sure. Um, I want to talk to you guys today about something that I spend a lot of time doing, which is uh, debugging PowerShell. Uh, I've been working with PowerShell for 10 years now and uh, worked on, in past lifetimes, worked on PowerGUI as a evangelist and then later on as a um, architect and as a product manager. And I used to work on PowerWF and PowerSE, so I've been working for working on PowerShell and PowerShell tools for quite a long time, uh, especially in the past with the tools side of the fence. And so through all of that work, I've done a lot of debugging and I've come up with a lot of tri tips and tricks that I use. And I'm constantly, I guess the curious side of me is always creating, seeing, looking for ways to create new tools that make debugging even easier and tinker around with how things work under the covers and finding cool solutions that weren't necessarily readily available before. So the talk I want to give today is, is about sharing some of that back with you. All of the content that I'm sharing here works on PowerShell version 3 and later. So this is not bleeding edge, latest and greatest. You have to have version 5, otherwise it's no good to you. If you're using PowerShell version 3 or later, anything I talk about here, you guys are going to be able to use. Unless I call out something in specifically from a newer version, in which case I'll, I'll highlight that. But in general, that's the way that I'm, I'm going to roll with this. Uh, so who am I? My name is Kirk Monroe. Uh, I go by the nickname Poshaholic. If you want to contact me, that's my Twitter handle, poshaholic.com, poshaholic at gmail.com, poshaholic at hotmail.com. You kind of get the drift. If you want to look for me, look me somewhere around the web, just look for that handle and, and you can find me and reach out to me. I work for, uh, these days, by the way, I work for a company called Provence Technologies, uh, which is, uh, we specialize in IT uh, solutions management. And uh, I'm a technical product manager there, still doing a lot of PowerShell uh, in that space. Uh, I've been with them for the past three years. Um, and just doing PowerShell as well on the side as a hobby and, and passion at home. So, so the agenda is just talking about a collection of PowerShell modules uh, that, was, that was, yeah, a collection of modules that I've written that help make debugging and defensive scripting easier, some tips and tricks, recommendations, best practices, things you can avoid, and hopefully you'll come out of this uh, a bit more enlightened in some of the things you might run into in debugging your own work, and so that it'll ring a bell when you run into it later and maybe think of some of these solutions and ideas and, uh, and be able to get through your, your issues more quickly. And because it's about debugging, I can't really teach about debugging PowerShell from a slide deck. So all the content that I'm going to do from here on is going to be in PowerShell ISE and then doing demos. Because um, it's going to make learning it a lot easier to see it firsthand. By the way, um, any questions that anybody has, don't feel you have to save them for the, the end. Interrupt me at any time. If I don't see you, just speak up and grab my attention. Uh, I don't have this scripted down to the wire and timed to the last minute. I leave breathing room for working with the audience, and if there's particular things you want me to drill in deeper on or have questions about, bring it up and I'll see where I can, where I can fit it and how I can handle it. And if I can't handle it here or can't answer the questions here, I'll be happy to do research and figure out uh, or talk to you after the fact in one of the uh, side rooms or, or in the hall and, and see what I can do to help as well. So debugging PowerShell is an interesting thing because debugging PowerShell often starts, well, always pretty much starts with dealing with errors. And when you're dealing with errors, it doesn't really matter who or what level of experience the people who are using PowerShell have. Most people get really hung up on the notion of red error text, where you'll find very seasoned people working in the industry for a long time, maybe even have done scripting. They run a command that you gave them, and they say it's red. And that's all that they give you. They just It's aired, it's red. And in the error text, if they look at it, the actual solution to the text is right there in front of them. It tells them specifically what was wrong. And so you walk over to the screen and you tell them how to decipher that error text as part of the debugging steps. And then you kind of start getting them beyond that. But some people like to actually change the color by default uh, through GPOs and whatnot, scripts, uh, profile scripts, just because it can make things easier for people. So I'm just going to load a, a helper function here first. And you're going to see me flip back and forth a lot between uh, this view and the uh, other one as I run stuff. So um, if you want me to jump back to something that you want me to explain in more detail, let me know. So here's just a simple example showing a typical, typical error. Um, there's a lot of detail in here that's really useful. 
Uh, in particular, uh, this is the kind of example where somebody might just come to you with an error because it failed. It says it can't find the path. And you go over to the machine and you say, well, it can't find the path because it says it can't find the path. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is the kind of thing that you can run into even when working with season, season pros. So changing up the color is easy. If you're working in ISC, there's psisc.options.error foreground color. So you can change the color to something that you like a little bit better. And I mean, that's blue on blue. So that's not a great example. Um, here's another one. There, you've got a wide variety with system Windows media colors to pick the color that you want. Makes it a lot easier. And actually just, I mean, even being experienced with PowerShell and reading through the text through many, many years now, switching the color makes a difference for me too. It's a small thing. It seems silly, but it makes a difference. Throwing this in your profile script and just using it for a little while, you might start realizing that the text that's in the error message does pop out more and you start noticing more things that are in it. So it's, it's a cool technique to follow. Uh, now, um, something else you can do with error messages is, so how many people here are aware that there's more than one error category view or an error view, I guess, one more way to, that you can view error messages. Only I saw one person half raise their hand. It's not many people. Um, so by default, when you look at error messages and you see text like this in the green down here, this is the normal error view where you're going to see some detailed text messages and some line uh, and character positions inside the script that ran, category information. You can also change the view to what's known as a category view, which is a much more terse view. So if I get that exact same error message in this category view, you can see here all it's showing me is what's hidden inside of category info in the view above. So if I select this text right here on this line, this is what it's showing me in the category view. And all you do is you set this global, global variable to error view equals category view. And you get a more terse format, which is good if you're experienced because it can get to the point more quickly sometimes. And especially if you're looking at the entire error variable and many, many errors one after another, this can just give you a line by line so you can scan it for things. So that, that's a good uh, tip. However, the categories the category view and the category information isn't always descriptive enough to tell you what's going on. I mean, in this case, it's pretty simple because the error type is item not found exception. You can see that the error message contains the path, so it really tells you. But there are cases where it's, it's more um, obtuse, trying to figure out what's going on from the category view, in which case you can just flip it back to the two error view equals normal, normal view. Or technically, you can do error view equals anything at all. And anything at all, it'll go back to the, uh, let me run the command again. It goes back to the normal view for anything beyond category view. So inside of the, this logic that PowerShell uses, it's basically just searching for this string, else normal view. So it doesn't really matter what you set it to. If you forget normal view, just, just set it to something other than category view and, you're, and you'll be good. Um, if you're so inclined and you want to take around with more error views, there really should be more. I had written more. Small side story. I was installing software on my laptop one day, running out of space quickly as I was installing Visual Studio. Rather than canceling the installation, which would have been the smarter thing to do, and cleaning things up and then installing the product afterwards, I decided I'll frantically go around and clean up some stuff while it's installing. And so then I found myself holding down Shift and Delete on my keyboard while I was looking at my Windows Explorer with my modules folder selected. <laughs> I asked myself, what do I do now? And pressing escape didn't dawn on me in that moment. And so I let it delete and tried using some, some delete recovery tools to pull stuff back. And I was able to get back 95% between that and things I'd emailed out people, but I lost a little bit of content that way. So that's one argument for using version control. Um, <laughs> But one of the things I lost was I had a module that led me to define, allowed me to define some more error views and it had some cool stuff. And I haven't yet pulled that back in yet, but I intend to. If you have things that you would like to see in error text by default that aren't there, let me know because it's on my to-do list to, I don't know where I'll get to it, but it's in my short list of things I think about. And so uh, I think there really should be more views. So just please let me know. My email address is right here. And by the way, all these scripts, I will share them so you don't have to 
jot stuff down directly from here if you don't want to because you're going to get the content afterwards as well as the, the slides, as limited as, as limited as they are. Beyond error views and the color, and this is going to sound silly, has anybody heard the expression talk to the bear? So, yeah, same idea. So you've got a rubber duck or your bear or your xamarin monkey or whatever other stuffed animal you keep hidden in your office. Um, put it on your desk when you have a problem and explain that problem to it because a large percent of the time you're going to find the solution to that problem by just reiterating it yourself. So people who talk aloud, actually, it actually does work. Um, so there's a reason why people talk to themselves um, and that's, that's one. And it's, it's surprising. I mean, how many people have had a question related to an issue and you walk over to a coworker and you're asking them that question and as you're asking them, the light bulb comes on and you know the answer to that question, right? That's what the talking to the bear is. So it's just about verbalizing what's in your mind already so that you can release it and put it in front of yourself by saying it and finding the solution that way. So enough about uh, some lighter weight techniques and uh, changing colors. Um, when you're dealing with errors, it's really important to be able to identify what the source of the error is. And so I'm going to go through a few techniques to help identify what sources of errors are. Um, this first thing, I'm just priming the pump by putting an error in the system. So let me just run this. And so I've got, I got 20 errors that I just threw into my error array. And you can look at errors inside of dollar sign error. It's just an array list. So if I run that, it flies by fairly quick. And there's 20 errors there, a few different types thrown in with a randomizer just to make it interesting. And so when you're dealing with this, you know, how many people have written a script and you run it and then you get error, 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 because they're not necessarily all terminating, right? There's the notion of terminating errors, which is an error that when your script or your module hits it, stops dead. You got one error, which is great for focus because you know exactly where you got to look. But it also masks other errors that are, going to, that are going to show up probably afterwards as you go through the debugging techniques uh, and steps to, to work stuff out. So a lot of times though, a lot of errors you get in PowerShell are non-terminating. And when you're dealing with it, it can be uh, challenging from a large list. Where do you start? So you can use PowerShell itself to help prioritize what the errors are. And so I, generally speaking, when I do talks, I don't use um, aliases and whatnot. Here I am, because we're talking about debugging. And since we're talking about debugging, I'm assuming a certain base knowledge of PowerShell. If you see an alias that you don't understand up here, raise your hand, let me know. I'll explain it. But most of these are, are pretty boilerplate. I mean, some people might not know that you can use shorthand for parameter names. So dash DES is short for description. And since it's un unambiguous in the sort object command line, it'll find it. Um, but for the most part, I'm just using a few aliases. So one thing that's great when you have a whole lot of errors is to group them. So this command is going to take all my errors, group them together, sort them in descending order by count, and then give me the count and the name so I can prioritize. So you run a command like that, and all of a sudden that list of 20 errors becomes much more digestible. So I can prioritize by what's most common and very quickly figure out what are the things I want to fix first, according to how frequently they're happening. I mean, the numbers can be misleading, right? Because you could be doing it inside of a loop. And you could have one bug that's much higher priority versus something that happens 50 times because you ran inside of a loop. But it still helps just in terms of digesting stuff and that mental blockage of getting rid of 50 errors at once because of this, you, you sorted things by group, so you can start breaking down the barriers and getting to the end solution more quickly can be very helpful. So leverage PowerShell's sorting and grouping capabilities when you're processing large amounts of errors to really see what's going on. And the other thing that's cool in here too is this is pulling out all the source code, all of the, the line references and the character references, and just giving me the text, which is really useful in terms of just reading what's going on. There's nothing right up there, and I might be able to figure out from that exactly what's going on. If I can't, I can go into dollar sign error and see what line numbers things happened on and, and figure things out from there. Questions so far? OK. So. Um, beyond processing large quantities of errors, there are a lot of details in errors that are, are very worthwhile uh, looking at when you're troubleshooting. So if I run this, okay, is that a good example? 
Yeah, that's fine. So let me go back again. So run this again. So here I'm looking at some error details for one of the particular errors. And actually, let me do one more thing first that I didn't have in my script. So I'm going to pass the entire collection out to form a list star. Because I want to highlight something. No, they're actually all showing the details. So I must have loaded it. I've got a module called debug px that makes it so when I pipe to format list star, I don't have to do dash force. Because typically when you run, and that might be still loaded. Let me just, bear with me one second. Uh, no, it's not there. So typically when you pipe to format list star from an error, you're just going to see the exact same text that you see when the error shows up on screen. You're not going to see properties on the left colon with values on the right. Typically when you run error uh, and pipe to format list, you just won't see that. Because the way the PowerShell team has implemented error formatting, it basically says, I don't care what you told me you want, unless you force it, I'm not going to give it to you. Which is a bit silly, and I think it's a bit of a design fall flaw. So in one of the things I worked on is this module called debugpx, and I will get to that. But debugpx makes it so I don't have to, or sorry, not debugpx, formatpx. That's why, because formatpx is loaded. I have a bunch of modules, and, I, um, and when I load them, they do work for me that I forget about because I load them in my profile. So I forgot to clear my profile afterwards. So go back to this. Here's what you typically see. Error zero, put to format list star, shows me the exact same thing that I would have got when the error came up. There, glad I figured that out. And then if I, but if I want to see it, the whole thing, I have to pipe it to format list star dash force. And that's because of what I was, what I was talking about, about how PowerShell just implicitly thinks I'm only going to give you this error, error text. But it, it's really useful to look at the properties. Because when you're dealing with errors, you're often dealing with exceptions. And so there's an exception property that you can dig into to figure out what's going on, if it's coming from internal code in PowerShell, or a binary commandlet, or a DLL, or something in .NET that you call. Well, that's going to come in often in the form of an exception. And so getting into that exception detail is important. Uh, target object, that's important because what object was being referenced when this error came up? Was it a file in my system? Was it a string path? So when the error, you know, does not, path does not exist comes up, that target object should be set to the path that didn't exist so I can figure out what's going on. Uh, the category info, you see that by default. Uh, other useful things are your stack trace, script stack, stack trace, and I'll get into that in a second, and invocation info. But there's a lot of interesting hidden stuff that's there that by default you don't get unless you pipe to force. So use the force when you're looking at errors, or now I'll load the module that I had forgotten I had loaded. And wait. I have a load order that's required for one of my modules. Now I'm back to normal. And so, so yeah, so with format px loaded, format px recognizes that when you pipe from an error to format list star or format table star or some format commandlet, that you probably really wanted it to give it to you that format. And so it respects that and just works around this one little quirk and format px is up in the gallery. All, all the modules I work on, I put up in the gallery. And, uh, and so now I get, by default, all the useful information from, from my error messages when I, when I wipe the formula star. So when you're looking at that, I mentioned there's exceptions, right? So you can do, th they're objects, .NET objects, same as everything else. So I can ask for the exception. And that, again, shows me text, not properties. And so I have to... Type that to format list, and again, I would normally have to use the force if I was not using format px to take care of it for me, and then I can get all, the, all this inf information inside of my, my exception. And sometimes there are inner exceptions, and so certain times you're going to run into an error. This doesn't happen all that often, but it does happen, where the error happens several, la la several layers deep through a whole bunch of logic and DLLs. And so you go from your top level error to your exception, which has an inner exception, which may have another inner exception. And so be aware of this inner exception property on exceptions, because if 
the error that shows up is not obvious to you off the top. What's going on? It may be because the text that's exposed at the outside of the error is not descriptive enough to what actually happened under the covers, and you have to dig in. So you have to just go through looking at your error messages and look at these inner exceptions. In this case, there is none for this particular error, but make sure you're aware of the dot inner exception and that can recur to multiple inner exceptions. And sometimes you dig through a few layers and you look at the text that's there and it's clear as day what went wrong. But because of details of code and how logic works and how things don't necessarily always bubble up to the top in the right way, it's just hidden from you. So dig through and you're, you can find a lot of interesting things. Um, leveraging the stack trace. So in, I showed you in the format list star, there is a script stack trace, and that's great for locations that are inside of PowerShell functions or scripts, or modules that are script modules, because it'll show you the stack trace of the logic that went through to get to that error, which can be very helpful in debugging and figuring out what's going on. And there is also a stack trace that is for when you're dealing with compiled locations and commandlets and DLLs, that's on the actual exception or inner exception or inner exception dot inner exception and so on. So you can dig through and you can look at logic. And so this is a bigger stack trace because this particular error came from binary code and less from PowerShell code. I think it was one line of my script logic that really didn't really make things. But I can see, I look at this from, from the, uh, at the bottom up, right? So the most, the call of the actual lab actually through the exception was in lookup command info at the very top, system.management, automation, dot discovery, dot lookup command info. So you look at this from the top down, from that's where the error happened to that was the first call in the binary code that I invoked. And it'd be helpful just to figure out what logic was, was happening, what things went through um, when the actual error came up. And you, this is, by the way, this can be intimidating to people dealing with stack traces and going through the stuff, but don't be afraid to roll up your sleeves, try it. If you can't figure something out and you need some help, you can email me, ask a coworker, go to powershell.org on the forums. People can now help you out, figure these things out and you start knocking them off one at a time and working your way through the stuff and it becomes a lot easier relatively quickly. The other thing, when you're dealing with a large quantity of errors, Rather than leaving them lying around in your dollars on error variable, I personally like to clean up my error variable because when I do, I like to just be lazy and do dollar error and look at everything that's in it. But if I leave it around for a long time, then I have a whole lot of stuff that I don't care about that I already dealt with a while ago. So it's just a collection. You can, you can clean things up. So if you dealt with an error, you can remove that particular error just by dot remove with the actual error itself. Or you can use index. So that removes just the, particular, the topmost item in the error stack. Or I can remove an entire range. So this is going to remove from 0 to 10. Or I can clear the whole thing. And so these are useful as you go through and deal with the errors that you have, just so you don't always have older things you've dealt with kicking around, because then you can be lazy and do dollars on error and see, did it catch anything? Oh, no, nothing came up. So good. So that's dealing with error details. Now. There's a lot of error management and error troubleshooting that happens without necessarily dealing with running through a debugger and putting breakpoints and stepping through code. A lot of stuff can happen just from using tooling to do work for you. So dealing with historical information, I mean, I put this in here just kind of as a joke. This isn't really, this is just from my type PX module um, where I can do all sorts of interesting things on numbers and, and relative dates and, and whatnot. Um, it's one of the modules I work on. But the module I'm talking about with, for debugging purposes is, is history PX. So let me make sure I don't have it loaded. No, I don't, good. So historical information. I've run a lot of commands inside the session here. And I can hit H. Actually, let me do the latest 10. So there's the 10 most recent messages, which just shows me what I ran, and not even fully, because it's truncated with dot, 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 and gives me some ID numbers. So if I want to rerun something. But that's not really that useful. So, um, so let me just, I'm going to give you an example here. Let me clear the history and then no, I'll leave the history that's there because I'm only going to work the recent. I'm just going to prime the pump here and I want to throw a few things in that, that, are, that are interesting about historical commands. So this code does the same thing twice, right? The first thing is it calls, it does one divided by zero, which is the 
quasi zero pair, so there's no one exception. And then it calls just to put some string of length. And then the second part, which is the try catch block, does the exact same thing instead of a try catch handler. And it's an important detail to uh, follow when you're dealing with error handling because if you look at the way those two things ran, so the code's all off at the top there, and then you see the first error shows up and you see will it let the text because that text still ran. So even though one divided by zero resulted in an exception, when I ran it, everything that happened afterwards, after my semicolon, still ran and went through. But then look at the second example. So after the will of blend, then there's an attempt to divide by zero, exception, and there's no string. Why not? Anybody know? Try exit is execution. When the error occurred, the try catch. Exactly. Catch. So divide by zero is a terminating exception, unless you don't put it inside of a try catch block, which is a gotcha in PowerShell. Because there are a lot of places where an exception terminates, and it's meant to terminate. It's, it's an exception basically saying, hold on, you're doing something really wrong here. But if you don't wrap it and try catch, then it's not going to terminate. So if you write functions that have an exception that is a uh, terminating exception, but you don't wrap and try catch, it'll do everything afterwards and it'll just continue running. It, it, won't, it won't stop uh, your, your function from executing the rest of the code, which may have unexpected consequences depending on what it does. So as a rule of thumb, even though it might sound uh, cumbersome, I try catch everything. Every begin, process, and end block in my functions has a try catch at the top level. Every single one. Every script I write, try catch. Absolutely everything. Because that's the only way, when you're running PowerShell, that you can guarantee that you get the same behavior every single time. If you don't, somebody else may put try catch around it, calling your function or your script, and get different behavior because theirs is going to stop on an exception that yours might go through and just generate an error, which you may think is just benign and you think, okay, that's fine, generate some error, but still there's all this other, this other stuff, except that other stuff doesn't run because they call it inside a try catch block which is a bit of a challenge, and so it's better to write your code so that it is robust and runs the same way every single time. So I try to catch absolutely everything. But when you do that, and I go, so I just ran that, and I've got two different examples. Now I'm gonna look at the history, and this time I'm gonna pipe a two format table. So if you look at the last two entries here, 41 and 42, they're doing the same piece of code, right? Uh, sorry, not 41 and 42. Uh, oh, that's right. Wait a second. Because I ran it as a block, it treats it as one command. So I'm going to run it two, twice, each piece by itself. So I'll run that, and then I'll run the other one. Now I'm going to look at the history. There. So 44 and 45, and pick that to format table. This tells me, it gives me a good example of what actually happened, right? So 44 completed, even though it was a terminating exception, it completed because it kept on running, versus 45 failed. So by using try catch, it will also be detectable in your history to see where something actually has a terminating exception versus not. Even though these commands completed, they may have generated errors. You can't see that from this. This is the built-in PowerShell history. So the only thing you can get here is terminated er with error or not from the uh, execution status state. But I, I've come up with a solution to help work around that. So I'm going to import history PX. That's also in the gallery. And now I'm going to just create a bunch of errors. Uh, I think I can run all these together. Yeah, I'll run those ones. So there it is generated a bunch of different error messages. And now let me show you the count of the most recent commands I've ran. So now, actually, sorry, again, because I ran them all at once. I got to do this one at a time. It's so one of the um, hard parts about when you're just demonstrating debugging and you want to run commands one at a time is you have to do it one off. So now that I did that, there. So history PX takes history and extends it. It will calculate the duration. So if you're doing any kind of uh, benchmarking around your scripts and your commands. You want to see how long one run had versus another, and you tweak your code here and there. 
and you want to automatically detect things, well, you can just have version A, B, C of a script, for example, and run each one, and then look at the durations and figure out which one took the longest. It'll show you success or failure. It'll show you the number of errors. It gives you output. So if you had a command that you ran that generated a certain amount of output, how many objects were outputs so with the number assigned to output? The number assigned source is how many commands, how many lines in that command that I ran generated output. And I'll get to that one in a minute. It can be very really useful because sometimes you run a command that's unexpected, so that generates unexpected output. So here's an example. Look at this function. New array list with one item. Pretty straightforward. Right? It's just going to take a, create a new array list, add an uh, integer value to it, and return the array list to the caller. So I'll load that. And now I'm going to run it. And now when I look at the results, I get two records. Anybody know what? Because it already started with one. The nope. dot add returns something. Yes. So. ArrayList.add returns the index of the value that was added to the ArrayList. But there are, and there are methods like this all over .NET. You call into some method, and you get, if that's the work you want, and returns a value that you don't need. But you might not know that unless you look at the method signature. And when, when you're dealing with this kind of thing in a very large command that you run and it goes and gets, maybe it's a you know, pulls the list of the virtual machines from all of your Hyper-V servers and your infrastructure and outputs one. And you're trying to figure out where that comes from. That can be really challenging. So that's where the number of sources is useful because I can run, run that same command, you realize with one item, I get the two results back. And then I can take a look at the history. So if I, uh, well actually, yeah, I'll show, you, I'll show you the properties I'm working with first. So inside of my history extension from history PX, um, there's errors and error counts. So you can go look at those collections in the default output. You want to see the counts. You can actually look at the errors for any particular command after, your, after it ran. You can look at the output after it ran. So you ran a command and you, for, you forgot to capture the output, and it went across the wire and did something that took a while. And you think, oh, shoot, I'm going to put that into a variable. It's got it for you. Um, output sources and output sources count. That's the one I wanted to talk about. Uh, with, with respect to this particular command. So I already ran it. So now I can look at, uh, actually I'm going to do it again here because I want to have it in the right sequence. So I'm going to get the most recent history entry, get history dash count one, and look at the output source. And so look at the top one in the text property. ArrayList.add one returns something. So it tells me what line returned it, the line number, the starting column number, and so that's all the metrics about where it was inside of my command that I ran, what was actually returned, which is really cool when you're trying to find these kinds of issues because it just can be a challenge when you have that needle in the haystack returning something that you didn't expect and you don't want to do a lot of commenting, commenting and uncommenting out code to figure it out and try to figure out where that, that particular piece is. And you don't have to think about turning it on. I mean, as long as you have history PX loaded, which by the way, you have to load manually because history PX contains a lot of commands that are proxies for existing commands. So natively, it's not going to, when you run get history, it's not going to say, oh, you want to load history PX because get history is on the box. So if you want to use history PX and you like this, then download and install the module and put import module history PX in your profile and you're good. And it'll always track the, the data for you. Um, Let's see. Oh, so you can also manage the uh, configuration. So if I run this command. So one of the concerns with history PX that I've heard in the past is that uh, what about if I go and get thousands and thousands and thousands of records, I don't want you storing all of my session inside of this history variable so that you're building my memory, my PowerShell session, and consuming the resources of the system. So it, it by default, takes a fairly um, light tactic for memory, for, yeah, for making sure it doesn't consume too much memory. So it'll only store the extended history information for the last 200 commands you ran and a maximum of 1,000 output items per command so that you don't end up having too much of a huge memory footprint. But you can call set extended history configuration and change this. So it's up to you to figure out how much you want to store if you want to store more. And you can do that as well in your profile. 
Another thing I put in, and this is kind of experimental, this one. So when you're dealing with history and you have commands that you ran and you forgot to get results, and it's great that it captures it for you, but there's also, you may have seen Lee Holmes put out a, I think it was a tweet or a blog post talking about setting up a variable for capturing output automatically. And that works some of the time, but not in every case. And so history PX takes that a bit further and builds it in. So if I run this command, get service, now I can do dollar sign double underbar because we didn't have enough dollar sign underbars. Um, dollar sign double underbar basically says, take the last collection of stuff that you got and show it to me again, which is really cool when you're doing interactive, I'm in the command line, running commands, figuring out what properties are, modifying my script at the same time, back to the command line, doing some more work, back to my script, adding the code, because I can do things like look at the values in dollar underbar, so I can look at the names, and notice that the dollar underbar underbar doesn't change. I'm still working with the same collection of services, but when I'm referencing properties in dollar underbar underbar, history PX is smart enough to think, well, you're just digging around, so I'm not gonna take those values and overwrite what I stored, I'll just let you dig around and, and go on your way. If I call get help, it's not gonna store that because who wants to <laughs> store get help in dollar underbar underbar? So it has a collection of things that it tracks and other stuff that it says, oh, I'm not gonna worry about that. And so even though I have to run get help, I still have that same collection I had from before uh, keeping track of things. And so the way that works is I have this get capture output configuration because it's all about capturing output. And in capturing output, there is excluded types. Oh, and also there's capture value types and capture null. So those are both turned off by default because value types are things like ints and strings. So it's just going to ignore those altogether and not store them because, again, it's not really saving any time. But for collections and actual .NET objects that are rich, it'll store them. But you can configure that and you can change, you can change how that works. So if I look at the excluded types, Then I can see these are all the types that it's going to ignore by default. The system of strings in there, help info short, mammal command help info. It's going to ignore results from get member and get command and get variable because those are things we very frequently call just to go and look stuff up that we don't necessarily want to store and overwrite something that we're working in as I'm doing this rapid back and forth. I'm at the command line figuring out some properties and methods and then off of my script writing the work. So I like this a lot because it helps me switch back and forth without always having to think about putting something into a variable to do the work I needed to do. And you can configure this. You can remove things from this exclude type list or add things if you want to and, uh, and it'll track or not track accordingly. Okay, um, so some debugging with breakpoints. Let me show you something really quick here. I'm gonna put a breakpoint <coughs> and I'm gonna run this. Uh, Okay, so I'm on a breakpoint right now. And the breakpoint one is the first line of my script on get service. When you're dealing with breakpoints, most people think of in ISC these visual breakpoints where you go to a line and you just hit F9 to turn on a breakpoint and then F5 to run your script and you work with the breakpoint from there. And that's really useful. And there's some things that you should know that you can do. So um, once you're on a breakpoint, Excuse me, and these work from the PowerShell native console as well. So if you're in server core where you don't have ISC or just in some environment where you are working on the command line, you can still have breakpoints and look around and do, do debugging without it. So you can use L to take a look at where you are and you can see the asterisk on the left hand side showing you where you're at. Um, you can do, uh, what's the other commands I want to show? K, the call stack. In this case, there's only one call, but it's very useful to figure out which commands were invoked to get me to this point. You can run H to see a list of all the commands I can run while I'm in the debugger. And these are good to learn and practice, especially step into, step over, and step out, knowing how those work. Step into will go into a function if you're calling a function, so you debug inside that function. Step out will, if you're in a function, if you just stepped in accidentally and you think I'm done debugging here, I want to go up one level, it'll just run that, the rest of that code, and then continue debugging at the next line after the function call, outside of the function. And step over is basically saying, I don't want to go in this function. I'm debugging something at the level I'm in right now, so that's where you step over. So those are really useful, as well as continue. Basically, it says let it running or quit. 
I'm done debugging and I want to stop debugging altogether. So learning how these works, how these commands work can be really helpful um, when you're debugging. And there's also shortcuts. So if you're in ISC, you can learn shortcuts up here in the debug menu, F10, F11, Shift F11, all of these. Or of course you can use the menu items if you like. Yes? Hey, have you heard of any way to automatically skip over like certain uh, function calls that you always want to ignore? Like say you have a log line, you're going to log at some output. You never want to actually step into that and debug it. Yep. You just want to always skip over that. So um, there is a property or it's an attribute. So inside of a function, do you own the code? Yeah. Okay, so if you own the code, at the very top of your function, put system.diagnostics.debugger hidden, open bracket, close bracket, inside of square brackets because it's an attribute. Right. You put that at the top and the debugger is going to totally ignore it. It won't step in if you want it to. Uh, great, thank you. You're welcome. So, um, great question. So, I, working with debugger in these breakpoints is, is useful, but there are other things you can do beyond the built-in breakpoint support in PowerShell that are kind of fun. So I have this module called debugpx, so I'm gonna import it. And now that I've imported it, I can just run enter-debugger, and I'm in the debugger. Or I can use bp or breakpoint, because those are aliases for the command. So I can now, maybe I'm working on a system where I don't have uh, PowerShell ISC, uh, but I have Notepad because I'm on server core and I'm debugging something, and I don't want to do line breakpoints because I don't count where lines are, so that I have the code. I can crack open my PS1 file in Notepad, type in breakpoint, and then save the file, and then run it, and I'll be the debugger on that breakpoint. And that's only if you're using debug PX because that's part of the code that I've written and I've managed my own modules. So, and it's, it's the same debugger as everything, right? So I can still look around. I can still get the help information. It's just another way to enter the, enter the debugger. So now let me quit out of the debugger. Um, so yeah, BP is an alias. Um, <coughs> this one's kind of cool. It works in pipelines. So if you're debugging something in the middle of it and you want to stop during the pipeline process, you can just inject this breakpoint or enter debugger command right in the middle, and that'll do it. And you can also do it conditionally. So in this line right here, breakpoint, I'm only going to stop when I'm on the Windows Update service in this pipeline. So I can run that, and it runs through all my what ifs, and then when I hit Windows Update, it stops. So if you're looking for some obscure conditions that happen in a pipeline, this can be really useful in figuring out, in stopping at that point in time, because something actually happened that you were waiting for. Um, oh, and they can also have reminder text. So sometimes you might have a situation that happens once in a while, really, really weird. You can't figure it out. It's just a bug that shows up on three or four machines in your environment, and it's really, really just infrequent. You don't know what's going on. Well, you can put in those scripts, if you wanted to, you can put a breakpoint with the condition basically being that, that weird condition that you're looking for, and some message saying, just notifying the person when it actually happens. So if I run this, then I get this text breakpoint that OMG it happened to let me know, you know, it could be call Kurt Monroe because it's the issue he was looking for. And then I can actually troubleshoot and debug and see what's going on. So for weird stuff, that's kind of handy. I don't use that that often, but once in a while it can help. Uh, oh, and also all these breakpoint commands work in unsafe files. They work if you're using F8. And of course this is all PowerShell version three or later. PowerShell version five has a wait debugger command which is slightly different from this enter debugger command that I wrote a while back. Um, there's some pros and cons to both. They do some things I don't do with jobs. I do some things they don't do with conditional breakpointing and messaging and pipelining and, and stuff. So it's, they both are complementary, and you can do them both with version 5 if you, if you like as well. Uh, a few more quick things. So I already talked about try catch and why they're important. I'll skip over that. Um, this, is really, this is interesting. If you're working with arrays, this one bites people all the time. If you're working with arrays and you're doing comparisons, make sure the thing you're comparing the array with is on the left-hand side, unless you explicitly want to be comparing the items in the array with, or any collection for that matter. So for example, looking at this code, I create an array and it's empty. So I'll do that. 